now in session. Please be seated. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We are back on the record this morning on the matter of the Commonwealth versus Blake Scanlon, indictment 1979-CR-168, counts one and two. Counselor present, Mr. Scanlon is present. Okay, is there anything we need to take up before we get going? I don't believe so, Your Honor. All right, I did get the defense request for jury instructions at about two minutes to nine. I'm given, as I, I think Mr. Walsh let you know yesterday, I'm given the voluntary manslaughter instruction. I'll not give the involuntary or the alcohol instruction. I don't think the evidence supports either one of those. So your rights are reserved to the extent that they were made or lodged. So you can have up to 45 minutes for closing. I'm not sure you're going to need it, but um, I give a five-minute warning and then a two-minute warning. All right? So there's nothing else. You can get and bring them in. I'm sorry, did you have a, both have an opportunity to take a look at the verdict slips? Yes. They're, both, they're acceptable? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Are you both going to be using the podium or not? Anyone? I will be. Yes. I will be. You will be? Yes. Okay. give a brief uh, closing arguments instruction before the closing arguments, okay? take a break between the closings I'm giving the charge as well, just so you know. members of the jury thank you all for your service in this matter um, so the questions uh, is any member of our jury had any difficulty whatsoever in following the instructions that I gave you before we broke for the day yesterday or do you know of anybody that has any had any difficulty following those instructions I see no affirmative response Has any member of the jury uh, heard seen or come across any uh, matter uh, or issue or fact pertaining to this case or the subject matter of this case since we were last together yesterday afternoon I see no affirmative response. And finally, does any member of our jury have any private matter or concern regarding your continued service as a trial juror in this case that you wish to discuss with me privately before we proceed? I see no affirmative response. The jury stands indifferent. So, members of the jury, you're about to hear closing arguments by the attorneys. This is an important part of the trial because it is the final opportunity given to the lawyers to address you. It is an opportunity for the lawyers to summarize the evidence, to call to your attention certain parts of the evidence that they regard as important, and based on the evidence, to try to persuade you to reach a certain result. However, what you are about to hear is not evidence. The lawyers are not witnesses. All of the evidence in this case has been presented through the testimony of the witnesses and the exhibits, which you will have an opportunity to examine and consider during the course of your deliberations on this case. Our rules are designed to ensure that the parties receive a fair trial, and they, the rules therefore prohibit the attorneys from making certain types of arguments in an effort to persuade you to reach a certain result or to favor or discredit either party. For example, the attorneys are not permitted to refer to facts that are not in evidence in this case. 
They are not permitted to suggest that you should draw inferences that are not fairly based on the evidence. If based upon your memory and understanding of the evidence, a lawyer does this, you should and must disregard that comment. The attorneys are not permitted to express their personal belief in the credibility or lack of credibility of any witness who testified in this case. That determination is entirely for you, the jury, to make. If a lawyer makes such a comment, you should disregard that comment. This case must be decided solely on the basis of admissible evidence and the law that I give to you. Attorneys are not permitted to persuade you for or against either party by appealing to human passions or prejudices. If you become conscious of any passion or prejudice as you, as you consider the evidence or engage in your deliberations, you must put these feelings aside and not permit them to influence your thinking. If a lawyer makes such a comment, you should disregard that comment. We are now uh, prepared and ready for the closing arguments. I invite Attorney Elkins to do so. I speak and after ADA Green speaks, the judge is going to be explaining to you that in charging Blake Scanlon with first degree murder, that the Commonwealth has taken upon itself to prove every element of murder beyond a reasonable doubt. And of course, that's their burden. But the judge is also going to be explaining to you that in charging Mr. Scanlon that way, they have also taken upon themselves the burden of proving beyond a reasonable doubt that there was no mitigation. And the judge is going to explain to you what that means. And in this case, specifically what it means is that the judge is going to talk to you about how that there are some things that are so in the experience of, of human experience that reasonable people can experience overwhelm, anger, emotion, such that they can't control themselves. And that that is something that you can consider. And what this means when you begin your deliberation, you must, for a moment, at least in your discussions, put aside the outcome, the very horrible, terrible outcome and spend some time wrestling with what led up to this tragedy. Now, one thing is clear. Miss Avery and Mr. Scanlon, at the time of this incident, were still in a relationship. That doesn't mean that a split wasn't coming. It doesn't mean that that hadn't been communicated uh, to Mr. Scanlon, to Blake. Were they splitting up? Yes, they were. But at, on this night, they had at that point been on again and off again since at least 2016. They had committed in June of 2018 to living together because a baby was on the way. They committed to living together, to making a family together, and making a home together. And Mr. Scanlon, Blake was there in August when Darla was born. He was there at Christmas, celebrating that first Christmas together. They were there. They were a family. They were a home. And he was working during that time. You'll see in, the, in some of the text messages that, that are before you that, that he was working to provide for his family, for their, for their home. And this is where I'm asking you all to look at this circumstance, which is undoubtedly inconceivable to every one of us in here. But to say to yourself and step back from that outcome, that inconceivable, horrible outcome, and think about the fact that when you have a child and when you have a home together, even if things are coming to an end, it's not just as simple as saying out loud I want this to be over, and that everything in your entire life changes immediately. The love and care and concern 
that you each have for each other doesn't just turn off like a light switch. And in that moment, on January 11th, 2019, yes, the relationship was ending. The logistics of who was moving and where they were going and when that was happening was certainly in the air. But Blake, at that moment, had every reason to hope, and I think every one of us would hope in that situation, the splitting up of a family, the breaking up of a home, that as you're charting a course for what life looks like after that split, as you're each finding what family and home looks like after you part, that you'll consider each other. And certainly the time was coming when they would need to expect to be out in the world and see each other with other people and to even know that they were intimate with other people. Certainly that time was coming. But on that night, they were still sleeping under the same roof, in the same home. They were raising their child. They were an adult relationship with adult considerations that don't just turn off as if you're breaking up overnight. By all appearances, the evidence in every way suggests they were both coming home to 92 White Street that night, whatever their separate plans were. And so, of course, when Blake Scanlon opened the door to that truck, he was devastated. He was distraught. Anybody would be. This is the part where you have to put aside the outcome for a moment and consider in that moment would reasonable people be upset and overwhelmed in that moment? And I suggest to you, beyond reasonable doubt, they would be. And listen, fault Blake if you must. In fact, I'm asking you, I'm saying you should fault Blake for not turning away when he saw them in the bar and saw what he saw in the bar and fault him if you must for going to the whip. Absolutely. He, he should have removed himself from the situation. I, I can't disagree with that. But Alexis knew he was there too. Alexis knew she was going home that night with him. And when he opened that door to the truck, it was because of what he had seen. And of course, he saw what he saw. And so you have to ask yourself for just a minute, what can you know about how Blake felt in that moment when he opened that door? Well, first of all, what can you tell about that moment from Scott Barnes' testimony? Well, it was the briefest of glimpses. It was a moment that for Mr. Burns was startling too, embarrassing perhaps, and I'd suggest it was probably confusing given what he thought he understood about the person he was with. But what it says about how Blake felt in that moment is very little because it was a brief glimpse. It was just a moment and he was Scott was having to pull together himself together as well. And how confusing is this moment for Scott and how brief is that moment? He forgets all about who he came with, his friend in the bar who he's supposed to give a ride home, and he immediately calls for an Uber. And we know what time that happened. It was at 1.19 a.m. You'll see that Uber receipt. But part of what you have to decide is was Blake Scanlon, in fact, overwhelmed and distraught. And I would suggest to you that brief moment from Scott Burns doesn't tell us very much about that. But he did hear them arguing. He did hear that it was immediately we need to go home. And he couldn't see them or where they went, but he heard them arguing and then they were gone. And so if like when you put a pot on the stove and you turn on the range, if that's the moment 
of provocation, if that is the moment when somebody is experiencing something that they would have overwhelm and distraught and, yes, anger and emotion about, the judge is also going to explain to you that the law says that you have to think about time to cool down. What can we expect in terms of and what does the law require in terms of cooling down before you think about whether or not this mitigates? And I am going to suggest to you, and I say to you, that before you can answer the question of did he cool down, was there time for him to cool down, I ask you to think about whether or not the heat had even been turned off at that point in time. By far, the best thing for these two people to have done after that emotional, difficult moment would have been to not go home together, 100%. But I ask you to think about what Scott Burns said he heard Alexis say in that moment because it tells you a lot about what came in the minutes afterwards. I don't want to be with you, Blake. I want to be with him. And that's not about whether or not she was wrong or terrible, and certainly it's not the case that anything about that situation justified how it ended up. But you're asked to think about the effect that that had on Blake. And you're also, I would suggest to you, tells you a lot about what happened in the minutes that followed. And here's what I mean about that. It took them just minutes to get home. You know that Scott Burns barely got himself together. He doesn't even remember getting out of the car. He immediately orders an Uber at 1.19 a.m. You'll look at those videos that we looked at yesterday, and you'll see that by 1.20 or 1.21, they're turning the corner onto their street. They're literally seconds away. It is just mere minutes from that moment of discovery until they're back to their home. And even as she's getting out of Scott's truck, this is what she's saying. And so there's every reason to infer, every reason, that that was just the first thing she said to him in an argument about what Blake had just seen. A thing that anyone in that situation would have been overwhelmed by. And you can be sure that that discussion continued on that very short car ride home. And when they get to the apartment, the heat stayed on. It's still at a boil. There's not a cooling off period in that scenario. We know that things happen very quickly after they got home, and here's how you can know that. She's still in the same top that she went out in. Nobody got into their pajamas. Nobody sat on, turned on the TV. There's no evidence of that. In the kitchen in their small apartment, steps from the door they came in on, they're in the kitchen. There's no place to sit. They're standing. The discussion is continuing. And based on what you heard about what she said when he first discovered it, you can be sure, I suggest to you, You can be sure, it is a very fair inference that the nature of that conversation and what she was saying and how things were going, that was not a discussion that was turning the heat down in any way. And so they're in the kitchen. The knife is an impulse away. And I'm not going, I'm sure, A.A. Green is going to spend a lot of time talking about the injuries and about the terrible outcome here. And of course, he should. That's his job. But I would ask you to consider one thing about the circumstances of the the outcome. What is that kind of outburst but a loss of control? What is that? But irrationality, impulse, and loss of control. 
All of that occurred within, by any fair estimation of this evidence, within minutes of Blake opening that truck door and seeing what he saw. Now, you're going to see, you know they were home within minutes. And you're going to see that there were text messages between Alexis's phone and Caitlin's phone back and forth. And I'm, I'm going to suggest you make of those what you will about who sent them, about what had gone on in the apartment, in the home before then. But know this, no matter what you think about who sent them and what had happened to that point, it was not even an hour since Blake saw what he saw. Less than an hour of uninterrupted overwhelm in the aftermath of an experience that anybody would find difficult and overwhelming. In the middle of an experience which anybody might react in ways that they just don't understand or know of themselves. The judge is also going to tell you about something called consciousness of guilt. There is a lot uh, this was a very short trial for a murder trial and a lot of what we talked about was about what happened after we know Miss Avery died. These texts back and forth, Blake answering on her phone as if he is her and the searches. And I, and the judge is going to tell you that you can consider all those things for consciousness of guilt. And this is what I say to you. Absolutely. Absolutely, in every way, everything about how Blake responded in that distraught and terrible aftermath showed that he was very conscious that he had done a very terrible thing. But that doesn't answer the question of what led into it when it happened. I'd also suggest that those acts, when you consider them, the, the, fir the first thing he does is he tries to kill himself. He, he, does, he tampers with the stove. He, 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 he texts back in this way. Those are not the actions of someone who had any sort of plan. Not even for a minute. Not for what happened and certainly not for what would happen after he had done the terrible thing. But a point does come when he sobers up, when he's not, he awakens to know that he has not done what he set out to do when he tried to kill himself. And he finally just says it. He says he did this terrible thing. He says it to the 911 dispatcher. He says it to his mom in texts. He says it to the police. And he is here today through me saying it to you. So yeah, you should consider the consciousness of guilt. But that doesn't answer the question that you're here to answer today. Which is, has the Commonwealth proved what it has charged? Every element, every part of it, including the part that maybe we don't even want to allow Blake, which is to say, beyond a reasonable doubt, has the Commonwealth proved that there was no mitigation here, as the judge will explain to you it means. So I am doing something that I don't do very often in this job. I am asking you to find Blake Scanlon guilty. But I'm also asking you to follow the law, to hold the Commonwealth to its burden of proving beyond a reasonable doubt everything that it is charged. Over and over again, Judge Callan has said to you, you have to put, and we said it at sidebar when we were selecting you as a jury. Over and over again, we said you must put aside the anger, the emotion, and the sympathy. And these are all things I, I very much actually hope you experience when you think about the outcome of this and when you look at those pictures. I wouldn't want a jury that didn't have a reaction to that. That's not what this system is about. But I hold you to your word and the oath that you took 
And after speaking to all of you, I believe that you're on this jury because you committed to doing as, as you said you would. Just putting aside the emotion and the anger at the outcome, which is understandable. And considering everything that went into what happened. And I do want to close by saying, when you return a verdict of guilty, as I ask you to do for voluntary manslaughter, you're not saying that anything about what Blake did was okay. I want to be really clear about that. This is not the law saying that, and this is not you saying with that verdict, that anything that Blake did that night was reasonable or excusable or justifiable in any way. That is a much different thing than what I'm asking of you today and what the law demands of you today. When you return that verdict of guilty for voluntary manslaughter, you will be saying that Blake Scanlon is guilty of a terrible and serious violent crime, a crime worthy of a tremendous amount of punishment. But the Commonwealth has not proven beyond a reasonable doubt everything that it must prove for Blake Scanlon to be convicted of murder. Find him guilty. Find him guilty of voluntary manslaughter. Attorney Green. Again, ladies and gentlemen. Blake Scanlon knew that his relationship with Alexis Avery was over, but he was never going to let her leave him. On New Year's Day of 2019, Alexis told Blake it was over, and she made sure to do it in front of her close friend and cousin, Caitlin, for moral support. On Thursday, January 10th of 2019, the defendant sends a text message to Alexis acknowledging that their relationship was over. And on Friday, January 11th of 2019, before Mr. Scanlon leaves the apartment, he is once again overheard saying and acknowledging that his relationship is over as he mopes around the apartment and says things like, my family is leaving me. Blake was not part of Alexis's plan that night. In fact, he was not a part of her plan going forward at all. Alexis created a Facebook page that said she was single. She started talking to Scott Burns from her work Alexis and Scott made plans to go out on a date. And as they were doing so, Alexis and Caitlin were getting ready in their apartment after the defendant left. They were doing their makeup and listening to music and getting dressed. And Caitlin told you what Alexis was wearing. A pink crop top with jeans that had holes down the sides. 
Alexis and Caitlin went to the Maple Leaf around 9 p.m. And Scott and his friends showed up shortly thereafter, as was the plan. And Alexis was certainly acting like she was single. Scott thought she was single. Blake knew she was single. He just couldn't accept it. Scott and Alexis, Scott said Alexis was on the lookout for her ex. Caitlin went even further and told you that Alexis kept looking at her phone to see where Blake was because she wanted to avoid running into him. But she did run into him, and it was not by happenstance or coincidence. The defendant followed her to the Maple Leaf, and Caitlin noticed immediately. Alexis was now focused more on Scott, and the two of them were sitting at the bar, openly flirting, hugging, kissing. Scott was also preoccupied with Alexis at that point in time, he didn't know who Blake Scanlon was. He didn't even remember him being at the first bar. But he was. It was because Blake showed up at the first bar that Alexis and Caitlin decided to leave. Let's get out of here. Let's go over to the whip. They paid their tabs, and they told Scott and his friend where they were going. Not Blake. Scott, we're going to go over to the whip. Come meet us over there. And he did. Caitlin's best estimate is that they got to the whip around 10.30 or 11. But it didn't end there. The defendant, once again, found them. Showed up at the whip. Not long after, Alexis and Caitlin were there with Scott and his friend. Alexis and Scott were still hitting it off. They were sitting at the bar, being very open about the flirting and the hugging and the kissing. Caitlin told you that the defendant was standing in the corner by the pool tables just staring at them and watching them like a hawk. He saw what was happening. So much so that Caitlin grabbed the defendant and took him outside and said, what are you doing? And Blake knew what he saw. He said, why the fuck are they hugging? If I see that again, I'm going to fuck him up. Caitlin went back in and told Alexis. Told Alexis that Blake is seeing what's going on. But Alexis didn't stop. She didn't care. Blake wasn't her boyfriend. Now the time frame on this is a little unclear, but it will become important. At some point in the night, Alexis misplaced her mother's car fob to the Mazda. And you'll remember that the defendant took Alexis's car that night, and Alexis went and borrowed her mother's car so they could go out. And at some point during that, that evening, um, Caitlin and Alexis started to look for that key fob. Now, they didn't bring purses with them. They didn't have a lot of places to look. Alexis didn't have the key fob. They looked inside the bar, they looked outside the bar, they looked everywhere. Caitlin even told you that at some point the defendant was outside helping to look for this key fob. No one found that key fob. Caitlin had to call for a ride home that night. And then at 1230 or so, Caitlin starts to text Alexis and say, hey, where are you? Uh, you know, it's getting kind of late. We know by that time that Alexis and Scott had went out into the parking lot, gotten into his truck, and they began to fool around. The defendant was still inside the bar with Caitlin, continually asking, where is she? Where is she? Caitlin honestly didn't know. But we know where they were because Scott told us. They were in his truck for 10 or 15 minutes, fooling around, things progressed, and they began having sex. The next thing we know is that Blake Scanlon, once again, tracked down Alexis, found them in Scott's truck, opened the door, and told her to get her things. Let's go. Mr. Burns told you that he found the defendant's reaction Odd. 
He was calm. He didn't raise his voice. He did not confront Scott. He barely even acknowledged him. The defendant didn't struggle with Alexis. He didn't put his hands on her. Scott didn't remember the conversation between Alexis and Blake as even being heated or aggressive. On cross-exam, after some nudging by defense counsel, he acknowledged at best that maybe they were talking with raised voices. The last thing Scott remembers Alexis saying was directed at the defendant. I don't want to be with you. I want to be with him. Scott sat in his truck for a few minutes to compose himself and figure out what to do next. And then he made the very wise and responsible choice to call for an Uber. And we know that happened at about 119. What we don't know for sure is exactly when Alexis and the defendant left the whip. But we do know they left together, drove back to 92 White Street, very likely passing that Westfield Soup Kitchen sometime around 1.20 a.m. We know that it is a short drive. It's about 1.3 miles. But we also know that at that time of night when the bars are letting out, there is some traffic. There are four stoplights. I can't tell you for sure how long that car ride was, but it was several minutes. And I'm certainly not going to ask you to guess or speculate about what was said, if anything, in that car. We don't know. That's just guesswork. I can't tell you exactly when they got back to the apartment on White Street. But I'm going to suggest some things to you that I believe will help you in deciding what the defendant did that night. And what he did was murder, to be very clear. Judge Cowan is going to instruct you on the law. That's his job and his job alone. If I say anything that doesn't jive with the law, don't listen to me. You listen to Judge Cowan. But I'm going to suggest to you that you're going to hear several legal theories that you're going to have to choose from. First degree murder will be explained to you by Judge Cowan. And the Commonwealth meets its burden, proves its case in two, one of two different ways. First degree murder can either be premeditated murder which will be explained to you, or it can be extremely cruel and atrocious. The Commonwealth meets its burden of proof for first degree murder if you find either one or both of those. And listen to Judge Cowan as well when he instructs you about proof beyond a reasonable doubt. It does not mean proof beyond all doubt. Listen closely to what Judge Cowan tells you about the elements of premeditated murder. There is no set time limit. The legislature and the courts didn't say 15 minutes is how long it takes to decide to kill somebody. That's preposterous. It's subjective. It's up to you. Depends on each case and every fact pattern. But what the instruction does tell you quite clearly is that premeditation can be formed over a mere matter of minutes or even seconds. Premeditation is a sequence of events set in motion by the defendant after a period of reflection and having a desire to kill and then carrying out those intentions. You can also find the defendant guilty of first degree murder by another theory, extreme atrocity and cruelty. And again, please listen carefully to the judge when he tells you what that means and the factors that you need to consider when contemplating that theory of murder. There are factors that you need to consider, like the number of blows, conscious degree of suffering of the victim. Essentially, was this overkill? You will be instructed by Judge Cowan that you can consider one other alternate theory of murder in this case called voluntary manslaughter. In fact, it's what defense counsel has asked you to find Mr. Scanlon guilty of. That is an appropriate legal charge, but you can only come to that conclusion if you find that the defendant was so overcome by emotion upon a sudden revelation 
of seeing his girlfriend having sex with somebody, that he was overborn, lost the capacity to consider what he was doing. I'm going to spend the next few minutes telling you all of the very many reasons why this was not manslaughter. And I'm going to start with the first and most obvious. They were not together. She was not his girlfriend. Alexis broke up with Blake 11 days before this happened. The defendant acknowledges that on the 10th of January. He acknowledges that on the 11th of January. Manslaughter requires, again, some sort of sudden revelation of infidelity. The defendant had spent hours on January 11th of 2019 following Alexis around, <coughs> watching her be romantic with another man. He watched them together at the Maple Leaf. He saw them together at the Whip. He even told Caitlin, I don't like what I'm seeing. Ladies and gentlemen, not liking what you're seeing is not an excuse. It is not justification to take somebody's life. Jackson, Your Honor. To stab them. Go ahead, sir. It is not a reason to stab somebody 28 times. That is something very different. That is not manslaughter. That is first-degree murder. Blake Scanlon did not confront, attack, or yell at Alexis or Scott when he saw them in that truck. He was not so overcome with emotion that he picked up a rock off the ground and started to beat both of them. That might be manslaughter, but that's not what happened. Blake calmly and coolly said to Alexis, get your stuff, let's go home. Blake Scanlon was able to control himself when he saw Alexis and Scott at the Maple Leaf. Blake Scanlon was able to control himself when he saw Alexis and Scott together at the whip. Blake Scanlon was even able to control himself when he actually saw Alexis and Scott having sex in the parking lot. Blake Scanlon was able to control himself on the ride back to 92 White Street. Remember, there was no evidence of a struggle in the car. This assault didn't take place in the ride home. The, defend, the defendant wants you to believe that Blake lost control. That is exactly not what this evidence proves. Blake Scanlon decided to kill Alexis Avery. He decided to do it in the privacy of their apartment. He decided to end her life. He knew that she didn't want to be with him. He had known for weeks. He decided that if he couldn't have her, nobody else was going to have her. He decided where the assault was going to take place. In the privacy of their apartment where there'd be no witnesses or nobody to stop him. No knight in shining armor coming to her rescue. I'm going to ask you to consider this piece of evidence very carefully as well when you're thinking about the defendant's state of mind. Is that on? Thank you. Remember the missing Mazda key fob? Those keys might have seemed like an insignificant detail to you when you heard testimony about them, but those keys tell their own very compelling story. The keys to Alexis's ride home went missing at the whip. We all know that. Alexis and Caitlin spent a significant amount of time looking for those keys, scouring for those keys. The defendant even joined in the search for those keys. Those keys weren't missing. Those keys were found at 92 White Street. This is Exhibit 35. Those are the Mazda keys that Jessica told you were hers, that she went to Alexis that night to take her car. 
They're located in the kitchen, right above Alexis' dead body on the kitchen floor. How'd those keys get there? Alexis didn't bring them there. She didn't have them. Guess who did? The only other person that went back to White Street that night, Blake Scanlon. He had those keys the whole time when he was looking for them. He was going to make sure she went back to White Street with him that night because he took her keys. <clears throat> the evidence in this case tells even more of a story. The evidence tells you that Blake Scanlon did not attack Alexis Avery the minute they got back to their apartment. Remember what Alexis was wearing when she went out with Scott on her date? A pink top, jeans with holes in them down the sides. This is Exhibit 18. That is Alexis Avery, dead in the kitchen, wearing leggings, no holes. Alexis did what many of us do when we get home from going out that night. She changed into her comfy pants, put on some fuzzy socks. Like Scanlon waited for her to change. Then he went into the kitchen and got a knife. The mere act of going and getting a weapon is a choice. And then we know what happened next. He stabbed her 28 times. He stabbed her over and over and over again. Each stab, each thrust of that blade was a choice. It was a calculated cold-blooded choice Action, Your Honor. to it's overruled. end her life. <clears throat> and Alexis fought for her life. We know that from the evidence as well. She had numerous deep, penetrating defensive wounds on her hands, forearms. She had the defendant's DNA embedded in her fingernails as she desperately tried to defend herself, but she couldn't. He just kept stabbing her. He stabbed her in the jugular. He stabbed her in the stomach. He stabbed her in the chin. He slashed her mouth. He stabbed her in the back. Ladies and gentlemen, that is not manslaughter. That is only one thing. That is first degree murder under either theory, under both theories. Waiting to commit a crime choosing where to commit the crime, and then carrying through with that crime is premeditated. And stabbing somebody 28 times by its very nature is extremely atrocious and cruel. Any one of those wounds sustained at the hands of the defendant could have killed her, could have been fatal, but he didn't stop with one fatal injury. He kept going and going. That's overkill. That's extreme. And we know, unlike a gunshot to the head that might be quick, being stabbed over and over again 28 times and being left to bleed out on the kitchen floor, as we know did happen, that Alexis suffered. The medical examiner told you it would have taken several minutes for her to die the way she did. This was not a quick death. This was a painful and drawn out death. That is first to be murdered based on extreme atrocity and cruelty. What happened after the defendant killed Alexis is also quite telling. We know that he killed her sometime in the early morning hours of Saturday, January 12th of 2019. We know that he then used her phone to pretend to be her while texting Alexis' mother. He kept making excuses, buying time, trying to delay the inevitable. Look at those messages that were downloaded from the phone by Sergeant McNally. 
Look at how Jessa becomes increasingly worried that she had not heard her daughter's voice in two days, had not picked up her baby in two days. And look at the last message that Jessica sends to Alexis's phone at 10.49 a.m. on Sunday, January 13th. If I don't hear your voice, I am coming over there and I am calling the police. And then what did the defendant do? At 10.52 a.m., he Googled, how do I mimic a voice? It's just unbelievable. Right up to the very end when he called 911, he was still trying to figure out a way out of what he had done. But there was no getting out of what he had done. The superficial wounds on his wrists didn't get him out of what he had done. Lighting some papers under the stove didn't get him out of what he had done. After he called 911, and only then did he text his mother to say, I'm sorry, I fucked up. I beg to differ. I fucked up is what you say when you miss your exit route on the highway. I fucked up is what you say when you back out of your garage too fast and hit a garbage can. I fucked up is not what you say when you deliberately, meticulously, and cruelly stab somebody to death 28 times. That is premeditated murder. And it is extreme atrocity and cruelty. Ladies and gentlemen, please find Blake Scanlon guilty of the crime he actually committed, which is only one thing, first-degree murder. Thank you. All right, so we're going to take a short break because my charge to you is about 45 minutes long, and we've been going a little ways, all right? So I'm going to excuse you out. I'll have you back in in about five or ten minutes, all right? Sidebar. We don't need sidebar. We're right here with no jury in the room. Um, then I'd like to put a number of objections on the record to the prosecutor's closing. Go ahead. Um, I'm just I'm not going to go by category. I'm going to just go in in, uh, in order. That's fine. Uh, so the prosecutor said that Miss Avery had her cousin Caitlin there for moral support. That was not in evidence, and reasons why Caitlin was there were actually stricken. Uh, the prosecutor said that she. Wait, let's. I can go That's slower. the first one? That's the first one. There's a reasonable inference from the evidence that she was there for moral support, okay? So next one. Second one was not in evidence when uh, Ms. Avery created that second Facebook page. Um, prosecutor suggested that she created it in the time period right before she went out. I don't think that's what he said. I don't think he, he said, I don't think he said when she created it. He did. He, he, he said that she created, she, she was going out, she created a Facebook that put that she was single. Um, and I would suggest that that's not in evidence. Yeah, I've, I've already instructed the jury that if the, any party who refers to evidence that's not in evidence, they're to disregard it. So. At the end, I'm going to ask you to re-instruct the jury on that after closing. Okay. Um, I, I don't know if I need to, I don't know if there's any law that I need to repeat instructions that I've already given, but I've already instructed them. So go ahead. Um, that's just going to be my request based on the errors in closing. Um, number three, he stated that Scott Burns testified that Miss Avery was on the lookout for her ex. That testimony was stricken in, in my notes. I have, I have notes about that. Uh, some of it came in, though. There was a piece of it that came in. specifically said that Scott said that. That statement was stricken. There was some evidence. There was, some, there was a part of that which um, I think came in afterwards for, but again, the jury's already been instructed that if anybody refers to evidence, the matters that aren't in evidence, it's their memory that controls. That's the entire reason for that charge. So next. Uh, next, he twice um, referred to the conscious degree of suffering by the victim. That's been removed as one of the Kenean factors by Commonwealth versus Castillo, 485 Mass 852. So. 
the jury can take that into consideration. I would just ask for a further instruction that whatever the lawyers say the law is, is not the law, and that what you say the law is, is the law. That's in here. That okay. is, that is, that is in this charge. Okay. Uh, the prosecutor also um, did some burden shifting, suggested that we had a burden to prove that Mr. Scanlon was provoked when they have a burden to prove that he was not. I didn't hear that either. That's, I believe I objected in the moment to that. Okay. Um, the prosecutor referred to... The, the jury will be, inst again, instructed on... I can't even count the number of times I tell them in the charge that the entire burden is on the prosecution to prove beyond a reasonable doubt the elements, and none is on the defendant, so... Okay? Um, the prosecutor also called voluntary manslaughter justification. It's not a justification defense. It's a mitigation defense. That'll be explained. The, the, word, the word mitigation is used at least twice in the charge. Uh, Thank you. Um, the prosecutor's inference that Leek had the keys. Give me a second, that, all right? I may, I may add something to that piece just to, so it's clear. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. is in there. Voluntary manslaughter is not a defense. It's a mitigation. Okay. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, next, uh, the prosecutor asked the jury to infer that Mr. Scanlon had those keys. Um, I believe that that's asking the jury to speculate. About you know, that's evidence. interesting, right? Because there's a fair inference in the evidence that she did not have the keys. The jury, I think, can be permitted to infer that he had the keys because she got in his car. She didn't have a means to get home. So it's a fair inference that she... I've always kind of wondered in the evidence why she got in the car and went home with him. The jury can draw the inference that she got in the car because she had no other way to get home. So that's a fair inference. Since I'm putting everything on the record, the prosecutor said that she was wearing fuzzy socks. There's no evidence of fuzzy socks. She was wearing socks. She was wearing socks. Okay. Um, Again, I instructed them that there's... I mean, I, I haven't examined the picture. I'm not sure... Um, yes, Your Honor. I, I guess the jury... No, I'm, I'm also making a record. Of course. But um, um, I haven't closely examined the picture. Almost all socks are fuzzy. So, um, of, some, of some kind, unless they're nylon. So, um, and the jury's been already instructed that they're to disregard any matter that they don't re re recall as the evidence. Um, I have two more. The okay. uh, prosecutor suggested that the wounds to Ms. Avery's arm were penetrating. The medical examiner testified that most of those were superficial and not very deep. Penetrating is breaking the skin. I think that, I think that the, the, the least penetrative, well, there was one that was very superficial, but some were up to a quarter inch, and I think that was a testimony with respect to the arm. I agree. And again, um, the jury's been instructed to disregard anything that anybody says in the case that's not the evidence. Um, this is call. the last one. Um, the prosecutor suggested that any one of the 28 wounds could have been fatal, and that was simply not the testimony of the medical examiner. Yeah, what do you want? I hear, I hear you on... Well, what did he say about that, Mr. Green? He said that there were multiple injuries that could have caused her death, being it up themselves. The prosecutor's words were any one of those wounds, referring to 28 wounds, and my memory is that wounds E and F could have been fatal and that wound N could have been fatal. That's my memory of the testimony. That's, That's my memory of the testimony, but again, the, the jury can, uh, has been instructed to disregard uh, any comments by anybody that um, they don't recall as the evidence, so as they recall the evidence. Um, and I would move Not for a mistrial denied. based on the number of errors in the prosecutor's closing. Okay, the motion for mistrial is denied. Thank you, Honor. All right, so anyone need a break or should we roll, roll right into it? I'm ready. I'm ready, Your Honor. All set, Jen.
may be seated. Members of the jury, it is now my duty to instruct you about the applicable law so you can perform your duty of deciding the disputed issues of fact in this case. You must follow the law as I stated to you, whether you agree with it personally or not. What the lawyers may have said or suggested what the law is is not necessarily the law. It is my responsibility and mine alone to instruct you as to what the law is and how you must apply the law to the facts that will be your responsibility to find in this case. You will notice that I'm reading these instructions to you. I apologize for doing so, but I must give these instructions completely, clearly, and accurately to assist you in your deliberations. I'm sorry, to assist you in your deliberations, I will provide you with a written copy of these instructions. However, the written instructions are not a substitute for these oral instructions, so please listen carefully. And I note that you have listened to me carefully throughout the entirety of this trial, as well as the lawyers and the witnesses, and for that, we're very grateful. And I want to thank you on behalf of the lawyers and myself. All of these instructions are equally important. You are not to overemphasize one portion of these instructions or ignore other portions. Although these proceedings have been recorded, we do not have written transcripts of any portion of the trial testimony to give you for your deliberations. You must, therefore, use and rely on your collective memories of the evidence in this case, perhaps assisted by your notes. Please remember your notes are only an aid to your memory. They are not a substitute for what you remember. Your notes should not be considered by any of you as a verbatim record of what you may have seen or heard during the trial. You should use your notes only to assist you to recall what you may have seen or heard during the trial. Do not be unduly influenced by the notes of other jurors. During your deliberations, you are not to show your notes to anyone other than your fellow jurors. And at the end of each day, if you happen to be deliberating at the end of the day, that you may be deliberating, your notes will be kept in a safe place until such time as you reconvene and resume your deliberations. Those notes have not been and will not be reviewed or examined by anyone, me included. After you've reached and returned your verdicts, I will direct the court officers to collect and completely destroy any notes you may have made in this case. I'm first going to talk to you about some general legal principles that apply to all criminal cases, and then I will turn to matters of law that are applicable to this case. First, let me discuss with you some general principles. Indeed, these are fundamental principles that apply to all criminal cases, and they are the presumption of innocence, the burden of proof, and the concept of reasonable doubt. This is a criminal case, and as you know, it is a cornerstone of our democracy that any person charged with a crime is presumed to be innocent until he or she is proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. That is a presumption that belongs to each of you, it is a presumption that belongs to me, and it is a presumption that belongs to Blake Scanlon in this case. The fact that Mr. Scanlon has been charged with a crime, indicted for a crime, or arrested for a crime is absolutely no evidence whatsoever that that individual is guilty of any crime. As I explained to you at the outset of this trial, and as I emphasize to you again now, an indictment is only an accusation. It is a procedural vehicle which brings a person before the court so that the person may stand trial, so that a jury like you may determine whether that person is guilty or not guilty. That is all an indictment is. The presumption of innocence also means that no person ever has to prove his or her innocence. No person charged with a crime ever has to explain anything to a jury. Exactly the contrary is true. It is the Commonwealth, it is the government, it is the prosecution, which must prove each and every element of a particular crime beyond a reasonable doubt before that person may be found guilty of that crime. If the government does not prove each and every element of a particular crime charged beyond a reasonable doubt, then you, the jury, must find the defendant not guilty of that crime. This burden of proof never shifts. The defendant is not required to call any witnesses or produce any evidence since the defendant is presumed to be innocent. The presumption of innocence stays with Mr. Scanlon until and unless the evidence convinces you unanimously as a jury that the defendant is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. It requires you to find Mr. Scanlon not guilty unless his guilt has been proved beyond a reasonable doubt. The presumption of innocence alone is sufficient to acquit Blake Scanlon unless you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt of his guilt after careful and impartial consideration of all the evidence presented during this trial. That brings me now to the concept of reasonable doubt. The burden is on the Commonwealth to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Scanlon is guilty of the charges made against him. 
What is proof beyond a reasonable doubt? The term is often used and probably pretty well understood, although it is not easily defined. Proof beyond a reasonable doubt does not mean proof beyond all possible doubt, for everything in the lives of human beings is open to some possible or imaginary doubt. A charge is proved beyond a reasonable doubt if, after you have compared and considered all the evidence, you have in your minds an abiding conviction to a moral certainty that the charge is true based solely on the evidence that has been put before you in this trial. When we refer to moral certainty, we mean the highest degree of certainty possible in matters relating to human affairs. I have told you that every person is presumed to be innocent until he or she is proved guilty and that the burden of proof is on the government. If you evaluate all the evidence and you still have a reasonable doubt remaining, the defendant, Mr. Scanlon, is entitled to the benefit of that doubt and must be found not guilty. It is not enough for the Commonwealth to establish a probability or even a strong probability that Mr. Scanlon is more likely to be guilty than not guilty. That is not enough. Instead, the evidence must convince you of the defendant's guilt to a reasonable and moral certainty, a certainty that convinces your understanding and satisfies your reason and judgment as jurors who are sworn to act conscientiously on the evidence. That is what we mean by proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, let me explain to you uh, about matters that may have occurred or arisen during the trial of this case and about the evidence and what you may do with the evidence you have heard in this case. So, uh, let me explain to you again what the respective roles of the attorneys in this trial are. The attorneys have very solemn and important responsibilities. It is their role to present evidence helpful to their clients' respective positions. It is also the duty of counsel to object when evidence is offered that they believe may be inadmissible under our rules of evidence. And the way those matters have been handled, as you have observed, is that I have either ruled on the objection from the bench and the case has proceeded, or we have had a discussion at sidebar where I have addressed the matter of the law issue, made a decision, and the case has moved forward. I don't think I have to point out to you that any such activity on the part of any attorneys in making an objection or in requesting a sidebar conference is not to be held against either the Commonwealth or Mr. Scanlon in your consideration of the evidence or in your deliberations of your verdict. Each of the attorneys is carrying out his or her duties, obligations, and responsibilities as advocates. My role as the judge of this case has been to see that there has been a fair, orderly, and efficient trial of this case and to rule on questions of evidence and matters of law that come up during the trial and now finally to instruct you, that is, give you the law uh, on the, of the case. Since determining the facts in this case are your duty and your responsibility alone and not mine, let re me remind you that you are to draw no inferences, favorable or unfavorable, to any party because of anything I may have said or done during the course of this trial. If you somehow think that during the course of the trial I made certain rulings that suggested how I felt the case was going in, or how any issue of fact should be resolved, or how you should find these facts, then you are to ignore it, because that would be improper for me to do that. I do not intend to do that, and the, and the decision you must make on what the facts are in this case must be free from interference from, interference from anyone, myself included. Your job, which turns our attention now to the role of the jury. Your role is the most important role in the trial of this case, because you and you alone will determine what the facts are. In a sense, you are judges when you do that. You are the sole and exclusive judges of the facts in this case. It does not matter what I or the lawyers think the facts are. All that matters is what you, the jury, find the facts to be. In deciding what the facts are, you all have certain tools available to you. The main ones are your own good judgment, common sense, and general life experiences. Bring those tools with you into the jury room and use them as you work to reach a verdict. You alone, you alone, jurors, determine the weight, the effect, and the value of the evidence and the credibility, and the word means the believability of the witnesses who have testified before you. Once you, you make those determinations of fact, it is then your duty to apply them to the law that I give you. If at any time attorneys called your attention to, ma uh, to matters of evidence that you do not remember collectively as a jury, then you are free to ignore it because it is your memory of what the evidence is that controls your deliberations in this case. In deciding whether Mr. Scanlon is guilty, guilty or not guilty, you should act without bias or prejudice, without fear or favor, and make your judgment solely from a fair consideration of the evidence. Emotion or sympathy for one side or the other has no place whatsoever in your deliberations. You are not to decide this case based upon guesswork or speculation or suspicion or any unanswered questions in your mind. You may not speculate as to what might be or might not have been 
with respect to the facts, and you must not be influenced by the popularity or lack of popularity of the crime charge. You are not to decide this case on the basis of what you may have learned or heard outside of this courtroom. Rather, you must confine your consideration to the evidence and nothing but the evidence, and your decision must be based on common sense, good reasoning, and good judgment. Your decision must be made without partiality and without concern for the consequences of your decision. So let's turn to another uh, important issue that I raised with you at the beginning of this trial. Our system of justice depends on judges like me and jurors like you being able and willing to make careful and fair decisions. All people deserve fair and equal treatment in our system of justice regardless of their race, national origin, religion, age, ability, gender, education, income level, or any other personal characteristic. You have all agreed to be fair. I am sure that you want to be fair, but that is not always easy. One difficulty comes from our own built-in expectations and assumptions. Those assumptions exist even if we're not aware of them and even if we believe we do not have them. Some of you may have heard this called implicit bias, and that is what I am talking about. We judges have the same problem, so let me share a few strategies that we have found to be helpful in this situation. First, slow down. Do not rush to a decision. Hasty decisions are the most likely to reflect stereotypes or hidden biases. Take time to consider all of the evidence. Second, as you start to draw conclusions, consider what evidence, if any, supports the conclusions you are drawing and whether any evidence casts doubt on those conclusions. Double check whether you are using unsupported assumptions instead of the evidence. Third strategy, as you think about the people involved in this case, consider them as individuals rather than as members of a particular group. Fourth. I might ask myself, would I view the evidence differently if the people were from different groups, such as different racial, ethnic, or gender identity groups? Fifth, listen to your fellow jurors. They may have different points of view. If so, they may help you determine whether you are focusing on the facts or making assumptions, perhaps based upon stereotypes. Of course, your fellow jurors could be influenced by their own unstated assumptions, so don't be shy or hesitate to speak up during your deliberations. You should participate actively, particularly if you think the other jurors are overlooking or undervaluing evidence you find important. In fact, when you explain your thoughts out loud to other jurors, you are also helping yourself to focus on the evidence instead of assumptions. If you use these strategies, then you will do your part to reach a decision that is as fair as humanly possible. That is all we ask. That is your responsibility as jurors. Let me tell you what evidence is and equally important what is not evidence in the case. The law does not require any particular type of evidence. Evidence may be testimonial, documentary, physical, as well as forensic or scientific. Evidence is what you have heard from the mouths of the witnesses who have testified before you under oath and given answers to the questions put to them by the attorneys on direct and cross-examination. You have, had, you have all had the chance to listen to each witness, to observe each witness, to consider all of what he or she has said and how they've said it, and that is evidence. Evidence also includes photographs, discs, documents, and other items received into evidence and marked as exhibits during the trial. The quality or, sheer or, the, the quality or strength of the proof is not determined by the sheer volume of the evidence or by the number of witnesses presented at trial. Rather, it is the weight of the evidence, that is, its strength intending to prove the issues at stake that is important. You should consider all of the facts and the circumstances and evidence and all the witnesses that may have been presented in determining whether the Commonwealth has proved each of the elements of the crimes charged against Mr. Scanlon in this case beyond a reasonable doubt. So some things in this case have occurred that are not evidence, and you may not consider these things in deciding this case, as I've already told you. The, indictment in this case, the indictments in this case are not evidence. A question put to a witness by counsel, no matter how suggestive it might be or how artfully phrased, is not evidence. It's the answer to the question and only the answer to the question that is evidence. Also, you may not consider and you must not consider and shall not consider as evidence any question, answer, or other matter that I ordered stricken from the record and told you to disregard during the trial. You may not consider any items or things that were only marked for identification but never marked as exhibits in the trial. And those matters marked for identification will not be with you in the jury room. The opening statements and closing arguments of counsel are important, helpful, appropriate, but they're not evidence in the case. The personal beliefs of me or counsel of this case on any, uh, on any issue in this case on what the evidence is, is not evidence. 
Anything you may have seen or heard outside this courtroom or while you were not sitting in the courtroom is not evidence. My instructions to you that I'm reading to you now uh, is not evidence. Consider the, ev the body of evidence as a whole. Don't make up your minds about what the verdict should be until after you've returned to the jury room to decide this case and you and your fellow deliberating jurors have discussed all the evidence thoroughly, thoughtfully, and carefully. There are two types of evidence in a trial that you may use to determine the facts in this case. There's direct evidence and circumstantial evidence. The law allows both direct and circumstantial evidence in a criminal case, and circumstantial evidence alone may be sufficient to establish guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Direct evidence is when a witness testifies directly about the fact that is sought to be proved and, and based upon what he or she claims to have seen, heard, or felt with his or her own senses. And the question then is whether you believe that witness or not. Circumstantial evidence is when no witness can testify directly about the fact that is sought to be proved, but you are presented with evidence of other facts and then asked to draw reasonable inferences from them about the fact that is sought to be proved. An inference is a permissible deduction that you may make from the evidence that you have accepted as believable. Inferences are things that you do every day, that we all do every day. Little steps in reasoning in which you take some known information, apply your common sense and general life experience to it, and then draw a conclusion from it. There are, however, several things you should keep in mind about circumstantial evidence. The first one is that you may not, excuse me, the first one is that you may draw inferences and conclusions only from facts proved to you beyond a reasonable doubt. The second rule is that any inferences or conclusions you draw must be reasonable, natural, and natural based upon your common sense, good judgment, and general life experiences. In a chain of circumstantial evidence, it is not required that every one of your inferences and conclusions be inevitable, but it is required that each of, you, that each of the inferences drawn must be reasonable and that they all be consistent with one another and that together they establish the defendant's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Inferences must never be based upon conjecture, surmise, guesswork, or assumption. And whether the evidence is direct or circumstantial, the Commonwealth must prove Mr. Scanlon's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt from all the evidence in this case. George, you have heard evidence uh, suggesting that Mr. Scanlon may have uh, done or, or said certain things that may be considered as consciousness of guilt. If the Commonwealth has established uh, these, you may consider whether such actions indicate feelings of guilt by Mr. Scanlon and whether in turn such feelings of guilt might tend to show actual guilt on these charges. You are not required to draw inferences and you must not do so unless they appear to be reasonable considering all of the circumstances in this case. If you decide that such inferences are reasonable, it will be entirely up to you to decide how much importance to give them. However, you should always remember that there may be numerous reasons why an innocent person might do such thing. Such conduct does not necessarily reflect feelings of guilt. Please also bear in mind that a person having feelings of guilt is not necessarily guilty in fact, for such feelings are sometimes found in innocent people. Finally, remember that standing alone, such evidence is never enough by itself to convict a person of a crime. You may not find Mr. Scanlon guilty on such evidence alone, but you may consider it in your deliberations along with all of the other evidence in this case. Witness credibility. As I told you when we started today, it is your function, among others, to decide the credibility that is the believability of witnesses. In determining credibility and the weight to be given to the testimony of a witness, you should consider and may be guided by such factors as the conduct and demeanor of the witness while testifying, the frankness or lack of frankness of that witness, the reasonableness or unreasonableness of the testimony, the probability or improbability of that testimony, the opportunity or lack thereof to see or to know the facts to which the witness has testified, and the accuracy of the witness's memory, as well as the degree of intelligence demonstrated by the witness on the stand. You may also consider the witness's motive, motive to testify for or against the Commonwealth or the defendant, and of course the interest or lack of interest of the witness in the outcome of this case. You may also take into consideration the age and character and appearance of the witness at the trial, as well as any bias he, he or she has shown for or against either Mr. Scanlon or the Commonwealth in their testimony in determining the credit to be given to that particular witness's testimony. In evaluating a witness's credibility, you may take into consideration any benefit a witness received or any hopes of... You should consider the testimony of a police officer or other law enforcement officer just as you would consider all the other testimony in this case. 
and you should use the same guidelines you apply to the testimony of any witness. In no event should you give any greater or lesser credence to the testimony of a police of, of a witness just because he or she is a police or law enforcement officer. Now, as I've told you, you, the jurors, have great power in this regard. In evaluating the testimony of a presented by a witness, you are free to believe everything that a witness says, some of what a witness says, or none of what a witness says. If there are any conflicts in the testimony, it is your responsibility to resolve that conflict. Now, the Commonwealth has introduced certain photographs showing Ms. Avery. The photographs are not pleasant. Indeed, they may be described as graphic. I instruct you that your verdict must not in any way be influenced by the fact that these photographs may be unpleasant or graphic. Mr. Scanlon is entitled to a verdict based solely on the evidence and not one based upon pity or sympathy for Ms. Avery, which might be occasioned by the photographs. Consider those exhibits only as they draw attention to a clinical medical status or to the nature of Ms. Avery's alleged injuries or to the nature of the incident itself. During this trial, you've heard testimony from certain witnesses that we call expert witnesses. Ordinarily, a witness may testify only to things that he or she has either saw or heard or somehow sensed, but when matters are brought out that are technical in nature or beyond the knowledge of the average person, a witness may be called to give his or her opinion to assist the jurors in understanding the evidence. Such expert opinion evidence is subject, however, to the same rules that I told you about with respect to other witnesses. That is, you may believe all of it, none of it, or anything in between those two extremes. There is no obligation for you to believe or disbelieve an expert witness merely because that person testified as an expert. In considering an expert witness's testimony, you may consider the witness's education, training, experience, and background. You are also free to accept or reject the expert's testimony in whole or in part if you are not satisfied that it is based upon the facts of the case as you find them to be, or if you find that the expert does not have a sufficient basis in fact upon which to support the opinion, or if you find that the expert has not had sufficient opportunity to observe that which the expert reports to have observed, or if you find that the opinion is motivated by bias or by the expert's own interest in the case. Please remember, with respect to experts, that expert witnesses do not decide cases, juries do. In the last analysis, an expert witness is like any other witness in the sense that you alone make the judgment about how much credibility and weight you give the expert's testimony and then what conclusions you all draw from the testimony. Prior inconsistent statements. When you evaluate the testimony of a wit that a witness gave here in court, you may consider whether the witness made an earlier out-of-court statement that differs from or contradicts in any way his or her in-court testimony. An earlier unsworn statement, such as a statement made to a police officer or an investigator, is admitted into evidence solely for your consideration in evaluating the witness's believability. If you determine that an earlier statement is different from the way the witness testified in court, you may decide that the witness's believability is affected adversely, or you may decide that it is not affected adversely. But that is the only purpose for which you may use the earlier statement. You may not consider the out-of-court statement as evidence or proof of the truth of any fact contained in the out-of-court statement. However, when a witness's out-of-court statement was made under oath, you may consider that uh, evidence substantively. Other acts state of mind. As I instructed earlier, Mr. Scanlon is not charged with committing any act or crimes other than the charges that are before you in this case. You heard testimony about alleged other criminal acts Mr. Scanlon was allegedly involved in. That evidence was admitted for a limited purpose only. If you find this evidence credible, you may consider it only on the issues of Mr. Scanlon's state of mind, intentions, or the existence of a plan or scheme during the time of the alleged crime. You may not use this evidence as substitute proof that Mr. Scanlon committed the crimes with which he has been charged in this case. You cannot use this evidence as proof that Mr. Scanlon is a man of bad character with a propensity to commit criminal acts. Rather, as I said, it is only relevant on Mr. Scanlon's state of mind, his intention, or the existence of a plan or common scheme. You may not consider the evidence for any other purpose, and specifically I instruct you that you may not use it to conclude that if Mr. Scanlon was involved in those other acts, he must also have committed the crimes with which he is now charged. You may have observed during this trial that Mr. Scanlon did not testify. Mr. Scanlon, as I told you uh, twice, when I, I told you this one before we picked the jury, and I told you again during the pre-charge, Mr. Scanlon has an absolute right not to testify since the entire burden of proof is on the Commonwealth to prove that the defendant is guilty. It is not up to Mr. Scanlon to prove that he is innocent. 
In this case, Mr. Scanlon has exercised his lawful right not to take the witness stand. The fact that he is elected not to testify is in no way to be regarded by you as involving the question of his innocence or his guilt. You may not draw any, any negative inferences from this fact and decision. I instruct you that in the jury room, you may not speculate about why he did not take the stand. I've told you why he has exercised his constitutional and lawful right. The fact that Mr. Scanlon did not testify has absolutely nothing to do with the question of whether he is guilty or not guilty of any offense. So you are not to consider in any way or even discuss it in your deliberations in the jury room. You must determine whether the Commonwealth has proved its case against Mr. Scanlon based solely on the testimony of the witnesses and the exhibits and evidence in the trial of this case. Now I'm going to give you the law on the charges in this case. For your purposes, they begin at page 22 of what I am reading now. The Commonwealth alleges that on or about January 12, 2019, Mr. Scanlon murdered Ms. Alexis Avery. Mr. Scanlon has denied the accusation and has pled not guilty to this charge. It will be your duty to determine whether the Commonwealth has proved beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Scanlon is guilty. Murder is the unlawful killing of a human being. There are two degrees of murder, murder in the first degree and murder in the second degree. Mr. Scanlon is charged with the first degree murder of Ms. Avery. To convict Mr. Scanlon of this charge, the Commonwealth must prove beyond a reasonable doubt each of the elements of first degree murder. If the Commonwealth fails to prove first degree murder beyond a reasonable doubt, you must then consider and determine whether it has proven all the elements of second degree murder against Mr. Scanlon beyond a reasonable doubt. If the Commonwealth fails to prove all the elements of either first degree murder or second degree murder against Mr. Scanlon beyond a reasonable doubt, then you must find Mr. Scanlon not guilty of this charge. The Commonwealth alleges that Mr. Scanlon committed murder in the first degree on the following two theories. One, murder with deliberate premeditation and two, murder with extreme atrocity or cruelty. To prove Mr. Scanlon guilty of murder in the first degree with deliberate premeditation, the Commonwealth must prove beyond a reasonable doubt the following elements. First, Mr. Scanlon caused the death of Mr. Avery. Second, Mr. Scanlon intended to kill Ms. Avery, that is, he consciously and purposely intended to cause Ms. Avery's death. And three, Mr. Scanlon committed the killing with deliberate premeditation, that is, he decided to kill after a period of reflection. The first element is that Mr. Scanlon caused the death of Ms. Avery. A defendant's act is the cause of death where the act in a natural and continuous sequence results in death and without which death would not have occurred. The second element is that Mr. Scanlon intended to kill Ms. Avery, that is, the defendant consciously and purposely intended to cause Ms. Avery's death. Intent refers to a person's objectives or purposes. By this I mean that Mr. Scanlon must have had it in his mind to do the prescribed act. It involves concentrating or focusing the mind for some perceptible period. It is a conscious act with the determination of the mind to do an act. It is contemplation rather than reflection, and it must precede the act. In determining whether Mr. Scanlon acted intentionally, you should give the word its ordinary meaning of acting voluntarily and deliberately and not because of accident or negligence. Intent is essentially a state of mind. It means the purpose or objective of a person at the time of the action. The intention of a person is to be ascertained by his acts and the inferences to be drawn from what is externally visible. Intent ordinarily cannot be proved directly because there is no way of reaching into and examining the operations of the human mind. However, you may determine Mr. Scanlon's intent from any statements or act committed or omitted and from all other circumstances that indicate his state of mind, provided first that you find that any or all such circumstances occurred. You may but need not necessarily infer from the conduct of a person that he intended the natural and probable consequences of his own act. There are two forms of intent, general and specific. General intent is when we do things more or less unconsciously, such as sitting down in a chair. We would not do it unless our mind first resolved to do it, but it does not require any concentration or focusing of the mind. Specific intent is the act of concentrating or focusing the mind for some perceptible period. It is a conscious act and the determination of the mind to do an act. It is contemplation rather than reflex and it must precede the act. Here, Mr. Scanlon must have specifically intended to kill Ms. Avery. 
Specific intent is a matter of fact which may or may not be proven by direct evidence. If it is not proven by direct evidence, then you may or may not infer from the specific intent from Mr. Scanlon's conduct. You may consider all the surrounding facts and circumstances and weigh them in light of your common knowledge and experience in order to determine whether or not to draw into the inference that the defendant specifically intended to kill Ms. Avery. The third element is that Mr. Scanlon commit, committed the killing with deliberate premeditation. That is, he decided to kill after a period of reflection. Deliberate premeditation does not require any particular length of time of reflection. A decision to kill may be formed over a period of days, hours, or even a few seconds. The key is the sequence of the thought process. First, the, con the, first, the consideration whether to kill. Second, the decision to kill. And third, the killing arising from the decision. There is no deliberate premeditation where the action is taken so quickly that a defendant takes no time to reflect on the action and then decides to do it. If after your consideration of all the evidence in this case, you find that the Commonwealth has proved beyond a reasonable doubt each of the three elements I've just defined for you, then you shall find Mr. Scanlon guilty of murder in the first degree committed with deliberate premeditation. If, however, after your consideration of all the evidence, you find that the Commonwealth has not proved each of the three elements beyond a reasonable doubt, then you must not, then you must not find the defendant guilty of first degree murder under the theory of a deliberate premeditation. Regardless of your decision, you must next turn your attention to whether the Commonwealth has proven beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Scanlon murdered Ms. Avery with extreme atrocity or cruelty. The second separate and independent theory for first degree murder is murder with extreme atrocity or cruelty. As noted, you must consider this theory of murder in the first degree whether or not you find that the Commonwealth has proved murder in the first degree with deliberate premeditation. That is, you must consider both theories. To prove Mr. Scanlon guilty of murder with extreme atrocity or cruelty, the Commonwealth must prove the following elements beyond a reasonable doubt. First, Mr. Scanlon caused the death of Ms. Avery. Second, Mr. Scanlon either A, intended to kill Ms. Avery, or B, intended to cause grievous bodily harm to Ms. Avery, or C, intended to do an act which in the circumstances known to Mr. Scanlon, a reasonable person would have known created a plain and strong likelihood that death would result or shared that intent. And third, the killing was committed with extreme atrocity or cruelty. Each of the following, each of those elements that I described to you must be proved beyond a reasonable doubt in order to convict Mr. Scanlon of this theory of murder. The first element is that Mr. Scanlon caused the death of Ms. Avery. Please refer to my earlier instructions on this element as they are applicable here. The second element is that Mr. Scanlon A, intended to kill Ms. Avery, or B, intended to cause grievous bodily harm to Ms. Avery, or C, intended to do an act which under the circumstances known to Mr. Scanlon, a reasonable person would have known created a plain and strong likelihood that death would result or shared that intent. As you can see, this second element has three sub-elements, A, B, and C, which we refer to as prongs, and the Commonwealth satisfies its burden of proof if it proves any one of the three prongs beyond a reasonable doubt. The first prong that Mr. Scanlon intended to kill is the same as I previously instructed you on murder with deliberate premeditation, and those instructions are equally applicable here. The second and third prongs are different from any element from any element of murder in the first degree with deliberate premeditation. The second prong, which I'll explain to you now, is that Mr. Scanlon intended to cause grievous bodily harm to Ms. Avery. Grievous bodily harm means severe injury to the body. The third prong is that Mr. Scanlon intended to do an act which in the circumstances known to him, a reasonable person would have known created a plain and strong likelihood that death would result. When considering this third prong, you must first determine whether Mr. Scanlon intended to perform the act that caused Ms. Avery's death. If you find that he intended to perform the act, you must then determine what Mr. Scanlon himself actually knew about the relevant circumstances at the time he acted. Then you must determine whether, under the circumstances known to him, a reasonable person would have known that the act intended by Mr. Scanlon created a plain and strong likelihood that death would result. The third element is that the killing was committed with extreme atrocity or cruelty. Extreme atrocity means an act that is extremely wicked or brutal, appalling, horrifying, or utterly revolting. Extreme cruelty means that Mr. Scanlon caused the person's death by a method that surpassed the cruelty inherent in the taking of human life. 
you must determine whether the method or mode of killing is so shocking as to amount to murder with extreme atrocity or cruelty. The inquiry focuses on Mr. Scanlon's actions in terms of the manner and the means of inflicting death and on the resulting effect. In deciding whether the Commonwealth has proved beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Scanlon caused the death of Ms. Avery with extreme atrocity or cruelty, you must consider the following factors. One, whether Mr. Scanlon was indifferent to or took pleasure in the suffering of the deceased. Two, the extent of the injuries to the deceased. Three, the number of blows delivered. Four, the manner, degree, and severity of the force used. Five, the nature of the weapon, instrument, or method used. And six, the disproportion between the means needed to cause death and those employed. The seventh, the seventh, this factor refers, let's see, this factor refers to whether the means used were excessive and out of proportion to what would be needed to kill a person. You cannot make a finding of extreme atrocity or cruelty, cruelty unless it is based upon one or more of the factors I've just described. If after your consideration of all the evidence in this case, you find that the Commonwealth has proven beyond a reasonable doubt each of those elements I've defined for you, then you shall find Mr. Scanlon guilty of murder in the first degree committed with extreme atrocity or cruelty. If, however, after your consideration of the evidence, you find that the Commonwealth has not proven each of the three elements beyond a reasonable doubt, you must not find Mr. Scanlon guilty of first degree murder under the theory of extreme atrocity or cruelty. Second degree murder. To prove Mr. Scanlon guilty of second degree murder, the Commonwealth must prove, the fo prove beyond a reasonable doubt the following two elements. First, Mr. Scanlon caused the death of Ms. Avery, and this is on page 31 of the, these instructions. First, Mr. Scanlon caused the death of Ms. Avery, and second, Mr. Scanlon either intended to kill Ms. Avery, or B, intended to cause grievous bodily harm to Ms. Avery, or C, intended to do an act which in the circumstances known to Mr. Scanlon, a reasonable, per reasonable person, would have known created a plain and strong likelihood that death would result or shared the intent. As you can see, these elements are the same as the first two elements of murder with extreme atrocity or cruelty, and you should refer to those instructions. In addition, as a general rule, you are permitted but not required to infer that a person who intentionally uses a dangerous weapon on another person intends to kill that person or cause her grievous bodily harm or intends to do an act which in the circumstances known to him, a reasonable person would know creates a plain and strong likelihood that death would result. If after your consideration of all the evidence in this case, you find that the Commonwealth has proven beyond a reasonable doubt each of these two elements, then you shall find Mr. Scanlon guilty of murder in the second degree. If, however, after your consideration of all the evidence, you find that the Commonwealth has not proved each, each, I'm sorry, has not proved one or more of the elements beyond a reasonable doubt, then you must find Mr. Scanlon not guilty of second degree murder. Turning our attention now to voluntary manslaughter. To prove Mr. Scanlon guilty of murder in the first or second degree, the Commonwealth is required to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that there were no mitigating circumstances that reduced Mr. Scanlon's culpability. A mitigating circumstance is a circumstance that reduces the seriousness of the offense in the eyes of the law. A killing that would otherwise be murder in the first or second degree is reduced to the lesser offense of voluntary manslaughter where the Commonwealth has failed to prove that there were no mitigating circumstances. Therefore, if the Commonwealth proves all the required elements of murder, but fails to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that there were no mitigating circumstances, you must not find Mr. Scanlon guilty of murder, but you shall find Mr. Scanlon guilty of voluntary manslaughter. Voluntary manslaughter is not a defense, it's a mitigation. A mitigating circumstance for you to consider is what the law calls heat of passion. Heat of passion includes the states of mind of passion, anger, fear, fright, and nervous excitement, Reasonable provocation is provocation by a person killed that would, like, that would be likely to produce such a state of passion, anger, fear, fright, or nervous excitement in a reasonable person as would overwhelm his capacity for reflection or restraint and did actually produce such a state of mind in Mr. Scanlon. The provocation must be such that a reasonable person would have become incapable of reflection or restraint and would not have cooled off by the time of the killing and that Mr. Scanlon himself was so provoked and did not cool off at the time of the killing. In addition, there must be a causal connection between the provocation, the heat of passion, and the killing. The killing must occur after the provocation and before there is sufficient time for the emotion to cool 
and must be the result of the state of mind induced by the provocation rather than by a pre-existing intent to kill or grievously injure or an intent to kill formed after the capacity for reflection or restraint has returned. Mere words, no matter how insulting or abusive, do not ordinarily by themselves constitute reasonable provocation. The heat of passion must also be sudden. That is, the killing must have occurred within a, before a reasonable person would have regained control of his emotions, and Mr. Scanlon must have acted in the heat of passion before he regained control of his emotions. If you find beyond a reasonable doubt that the Commonwealth has proven that Mr. Scanlon committed the crime of murder, but has failed to prove the absence of any mitigating circumstances beyond a reasonable doubt, you shall find Mr. Scanlon guilty of voluntary manslaughter. Your duty to return a verdict of the highest crime proven and jury unanimity. I have now instructed you on the crimes of first degree murder, second degree murder, and voluntary manslaughter. On this indictment, if you conclude beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Scanlon is guilty, you have a duty to return a verdict of guilty on the highest crime the Commonwealth has proved beyond a reasonable doubt against him, up to and including the charge defense of first degree murder. And you should mark the appropriate space on the verdict slip which reflects your unanimous verdict. You will note that on the verdict slip, the theories of first degree murder as well as second degree murder and voluntary manslaughter are set forth. Before you may find Mr. Scanlon guilty of murder in the first degree, you must unanimously agree as a jury, that is 12 out of 12 deliberating jurors, on the theory or theories under which you are finding Mr. Scanlon guilty. You may find Mr. Scanlon guilty under more than one theory, but the jury must be unanimous on that verdict. That is, all 12 of you must agree as to each theory under which you find him guilty. You should address and deliberate on the evidence on each theory of first degree murder separately and reach a conclusion about each theory separately. Thus, you may find that the Commonwealth has proved none of the two theories, one theory or two theories of first degree murder against the defendant beyond a reasonable doubt. And you should indicate your verdict by checking the appropriate space or spaces on the verdict slip. If you have determined that the Commonwealth has failed to prove either first degree or second degree murder beyond a reasonable doubt, then you shall return a verdict of not guilty on this indictment and mark that space on the verdict slip. There's a second charge in this case presented to you, and that is assault and battery by means of a dangerous weapon. Mr. Scanlon is separately charged with having committed an intentional assault and battery by means of a dangerous weapon, specifically a knife on Ms. Avery. To prove Mr. Scanlon guilty of this offense, the Commonwealth must prove three things beyond a reasonable doubt, and this is on page 36. First, that Mr. Scanlon touched Ms. Avery, however slightly, without having any right or excuse for doing so. Second, that Mr. Scanlon intended to touch Ms. Avery. And third, that the touching was done with a dangerous weapon. The Commonwealth must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Scanlon intended to touch Ms. Avery with a dangerous weapon in the sense that Mr. Scanlon consciously and deliberately intended the touching to occur and that the touching was not merely accidental or negligent. The Commonwealth is not required to prove that Mr. Scanlon specifically intended to cause injury to Ms. Avery for this charge. It is not necessary for the Commonwealth to prove that Mr. Scanlon actually caused injury to Ms. Avery with a dangerous weapon. Any slight touching is sufficient if it was done with a dangerous weapon. If the alleged weapon is not inherently dangerous, you must determine if it is a dangerous weapon. An item that is normally used for innocent purposes can become a dangerous weapon if it is intentionally used as a weapon in a dangerous or potentially dangerous fashion. Therefore, you must believe beyond, you must find beyond a reasonable doubt that where the we, that find beyond a reasonable doubt that where the weapon was not inherently dangerous, the defendant used it as a weapon with the intent to use it in a dangerous or potentially dangerous fashion. The law considers any item to be a dangerous weapon if it is intentionally used in a way that, is reason that it reasonably appears to be capable of causing serious injury or death to another person. For example, a lighted cigarette can be a dangerous weapon if it is used to burn somebody, as is a pencil if it is aimed at someone's eyes. In deciding whether an item was intentionally used as a dangerous weapon, you may consider the circumstances surrounding the alleged crime, the nature, size, and shape of the item, and the way it was handled or controlled. If you find that the Commonwealth has proven all three elements beyond a reasonable doubt with respect to this charge, then you shall find Mr. Scanlon guilty of assault and battery with a dangerous weapon. If you find the, that the Commonwealth has failed to prove one or more elements beyond a reasonable doubt, then you shall find Mr. Scanlon not guilty of this charge. These will constitute my closing remarks to you. I'm about to submit this case to you for your consideration and your deliberation. I need not remind you 
that you'll have a grave responsibility in this case. But I believe, I know that you will bring to bear all you will bring to bear all of your wisdom, judgment, and conscience you possess in reaching verdicts on this case. I want you to understand that your responsibility in this case does not extend beyond certain areas. You are not responsible for the conduct of this trial. You're not responsible for anything this defendant may have done, if anything. You're not responsible for any punishment that may flow if it does. Those things are not your responsibility, and you must not be concerned with those matters when considering the evidence and working to reach a verdict. As I told you earlier, the verdict, whether guilty or not guilty, must be unanimous. The jury does not have a verdict unless and until all 12 deliberating jurors agree. You do not have a guilty verdict unless all 12 agree that it is guilty, and by the same token, you do not have a not guilty verdict unless all 12 agree that it is not guilty. All we ask of you is that you decide this case with integrity and principle. We all expect you to reach an impartial verdict without sympathy, without prejudice, and not prompted by any facts except those you've heard here in court during the trial of this case. All we want is a verdict dictated by your logic, because emotions have no place in the rendition of your verdict. We are looking for an impartial judgment dictated by your fair reasoning and the fullest discharge of the oaths that you all took as jurors when this case started. Now, some housekeeping matters. If during the course of your deliberations you should have a question about the law, the procedure you should follow is this. First, you must all agree on the form of the question. The foreperson, who I'll uh, pick in a few moments, will have to write out that question and present it to the court officer who will bring it to me. I will call the attorneys together. We will discuss the question and how I should respond to it. Then we will either bring you into the courtroom to respond to the question in person, if appropriate, and the parties agree, I will respond to your question in writing and return uh, a written uh, answer to the jury room, in which case um, you will just simply receive a writing by me and sign. The procedure that I've just discussed, that is if you send a note out with a question, means that there may be a lag in time from when you ask the question to when I can respond to you. If possible, you should continue to your deliberations while waiting for an answer to your question. If not, then stop until I can get a response to you. If it becomes necessary to communicate with me on any other matter, please send a note out via the court officer from the foreperson. No member of this jury should attempt to communicate with me by any other means other than assigned writing, and I will not communicate with any member of the jury on any subject touching on the merits of this case other than assigned writing. You are not to communicate with any of the court officers on any subject matter touching on the merits of this case. Your communications with the court officers should be about scheduling breaks and when you come back to the courtroom, do not discuss with the court officers or anybody else what's going on in the jury room. Also, please keep this in mind. You are never to reveal to any person, not even to me, how you stand numerically on a particular charge until you have reached a unanimous verdict. Then and only then will you report your verdict here in open court unless I instruct you otherwise. I must now select a foreperson to assist in your deliberations. Your Honor. Yes. May we approach before you the uh, alternate selection?
couple of things I want to talk to you about before I select the four person. Um, there's a phone that's in evidence. I don't think you have a charger in evidence, but you're not to t try to turn that on or look inside that phone or get inside that phone in any way. It is what it is. You're not to power it up and look at it um, uh, at that time. Second, I did notice during the course of the charge that some of you were jotting down notes. Uh, I need to remind you, I said this when I started, the oral instructions here in court govern the law that you're to apply and nothing else. So to the extent, in any way, uh, my oral instructions differ from the written instructions that I'll send in, it's the oral instructions that govern. To the extent that any of you jotted down any notes about when I was making a closing argument, I'm sorry, when I was making a uh, reading to you the law in this particular case, um, you must not use those notes as a substitute for the complete body of the law that I gave you during the course of these oral instructions. And as I said to you when we started, the instructions that I give you must be taken as a whole and not any one focus on any particular part, but you must regard the instructions uh, as a whole. And again, if you have any questions about the law at any point in time, and by saying that, I'm not suggesting in any way that you should or even might. Uh, the procedure is not to speculate, but it is to write a note to me about what you want uh, further instruction on, if possible, and then I'll get back to you in the manner that I've described to you, okay? So there's that. So now I need to turn my attention to um, selecting a four-person. I've selected juror number 75 and C10 to be the four-person for this case. The four-person's four vote or opinion is not entitled to any more weight than the vote or opinion of any other juror. Each member of the deliberating jury has an equal voice in the deliberations and an equal vote with respect to the verdict or the charge on the, on the charge in this case, charges in this case. We have a four person for two reasons. First is to help you organize yourself and to act as the group's facilitator of your discussions and your deliberations. And second is to report your verdict on behalf of the jury in open court when you've reached your verdict. I thank you in advance for this additional service. The four person's responsibility is to do the best that she can to make sure that the deliberations are conducted fairly, orderly, and efficiently. If everyone wants to talk at once, if there is no order to the proceedings, you will all probably feel very frustrated and feel like you are not making any progress to a resolution of this case. You must go about your business in a business-like fashion. Another situation which can, which can sometimes arise in deliberations with a group of this size is that only a few jurors, usually the more vocally assertive, tend to dominate the discussion to the exclusion of others on the jury who are perhaps quieter but whose views are nonetheless equally deserving of being heard. It would be unfortunate if an atmosphere develops whereby certain jurors are reluctant to put forth their views for fear that others in the jury might be quick to criticize or put down that juror or that juror's view. We look to the foreperson to make sure that everybody in the room that wishes to speak has a full and fair opportunity to contribute whatever they feel needs to be contributed. Now reducing and sending out the jury. When we pick a jury at the beginning of a trial, we never know whether some personal emergency will arise during the trial which will require that one or more of the jurors be excused from further jury duty. To avoid having to start the trial all over again if that should occur, and it has, we impanel uh, 15 jurors, even though the case will eventually be decided by only 12 of you. The time has now come to reduce your number to that 12. The clerk will draw three of your juror numbers the seats which you are sitting in at random. These jurors will be designated as the first, second, and third alternate jurors and will not take part in the deliberations unless it is necessary to provide a substitute for one of the other jurors. Now, before we do that, I want to tell you, if fate, the draw, if you will, makes you an alternate juror, please do not take it personally. Your presence up to this point and your continuing availability, if you should have, should be needed, is vital to this case and to the administration of justice. And uh, uh, we still need the um, alternate jurors to be available if one of the sitting jurors cannot continue. The court officers will make you as comfortable as possible while the jury deliberates, while that takes place. I will again ask the alternate jurors not to discuss this case among yourselves. Our clerk will now reduce this to 12.
you have been selected as an alternate juror in seat 13. Please follow the court officer. <laughs> juror in seat 7 have been selected as an alternate. Please follow the court officer. So with respect to the alternates, and, and now we have our jury of tw deliberating jury of 12 and we have our three alternates, it is important, it is crucial that the, that the deliberating jury not discuss in any way with the alternates what is occurring during the jury deliberation process. It will be kept separate uh, from the deliberating jury, but there may be occasions when we're coming in and out of court when you're lined up and so forth. You must not discuss in any way between the, the alternates and the deliberating jury um, what is occurring during the course of the, uh, the, uh, the deliberation at that time. As I've said earlier, to return a valid verdict on these charges, each deliberating juror must agree to that verdict. Each juror has a duty to consult with one another and to deliberate with a view to reaching an agreement if it can be done without violence to one's individual judgment. I'm sure I'm not telling you a secret when I say that a unanimous verdict of 12 deliberating jurors is not necessarily an easy task. It will require a very conscientious approach to your duty as jurors. I suggest that you each approach it with a mutual respect for the opinions of your fellow jurors, that you each have a disposition to listen to one another, to be convinced as to one another's judgments and persuaded as to one another's views. Don't be afraid to change your opinion if the discussion persuades you that you should. Don't hesitate to re-examine your own views and come to a different conclusion if you are convinced that your earlier conclusion was erroneous. But do not come to a decision simply because the other jurors think it is the correct decision. No juror should surrender his or her honest conviction as to the weight or the effect of the evidence solely because of the opinion of his or her fellow jurors or for the mere purpose of returning a verdict. Each of you must decide the case for yourselves. And you should do so only after you've considered all the evidence, discussed it fully and impartially with your fellow jurors, and listened to the views of your fellow jurors. You have all seen and heard the same evidence. You have done so with the same degree of attention. None of you are partisans. You are not advocates. You're judges of the facts of this case. I'm confident that you will discharge your duty faithfully as well and well as you work to reach a verdict on this case. The counsel need to see me at sidebar. All right. Um, we now need to swear our court officers in. I suggest you pay attention to the oath that they take as well as they're uh, taking it. Would you all raise your right hands. Do you each solemnly swear that you will keep this jury together in some convenient place until they are discharged of their verdict and that you will permit no person to speak to them nor speak to them yourselves except by order of the court or to ask, ask them if they have agreed so help you God. So help me God. Thank you. So, jurors, I'm going to now send you out to begin your deliberations. We will send the exhibits in to you in just a few moments after the attorneys and I have checked them to make sure that they're complete and appropriate. I will send you in, I'll have marked for identification a copy of what I read to you, and that will be brought in shortly thereafter. There are a few matters that I need to fix uh, in uh, and reprint um, as I made corrections as I went through. So that may take a few more uh, minutes than sending the exhibits in. I will now order you to uh, uh, go to the jury room and uh, begin your deliberations on the case. Can you bring your notepads this time? Jury exiting, all rise. few changes to make. What I'm going to do is make them, print it, sign it, give it to Mr. Walsh. I'll send it out. You can check it out. And when it's okay, it can be sent in. I don't normally come out to talk to you about the exhibits before they go in, but if you need me, come in and um, have Mr. Walsh come get me. I can come out and do it. I just want to make sure that you 
before the exhibits go in, the parties indicate that they're satisfied with the exhibits going in, as well as the um, final jury instructions. So with that, I'll be available. Stepping up. I'm sorry, which one? D? P. P for identification. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All rise.
the record, Your Honor. Told, told we have a verdict, so we'll get the jurors and bring them in and take the verdict. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Madam Four Person, has the jury agreed upon its verdict? Yes, we have. Would you hand the verdict slips to the court officer, please? person, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, hearken to your verdict as the court will record it. On indictment 19, CR 168, count one charging murder, you upon your oath say the defendant is guilty of murder in the first degree by reason of extreme atrocity and cruelty. So say you, Madam Four Person. Yes. So say you, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. Yes. Has this verdict been unanimous? Count two, charging assault and battery by means of a dangerous weapon, you upon your oath say that the defendant is guilty. So say you, Madam Four Person? Yes. So say you, ladies and gentlemen of the jury? Yes. Has this verdict been unanimous? Yes. yes. Thank you. You may be seated. Sir, you may be seated. All right. Members of the jury, I want to take this one final moment publicly to thank you for your service in this case. Thank you for the careful attention you gave me, the lawyers, and the parties in this case, and for your work to deliver a verdict. Uh, I told you during the course of the trial that when the trial was over, you were free to speak to anybody you'd like about this particular case. Uh, but I want to let you know that the opposite of that is also true. You are perfectly free not to speak to anybody about this case ever again. I suggest to you, given the privacy of your jury deliberations, that you consider that when you're discuss if you choose to discuss the case uh, with anybody outside this courtroom that you uh, keep in mind the sanctity and privacy of the jury deliberations and and uh, and uh, provide that to one another to keep to keep that private but again your discharge as jurors that's entirely up to you now you're under no sanction or order of the court so thank you very much I will um, come back to talk to you and thank you privately in just a few moments thank you all for your service sure, thank you. all right Mr. Green. Thank you, Your Honor. The Commonwealth would move for sentencing, but we would ask the court uh, for some time for the family to hear impact statements and collect themselves. I know that you're not available on Friday. Um, Monday is the day after a holiday. The family has asked me if we could schedule sentencing on Tuesday. Do you have any um, issue with Tuesday, counsel? Yeah, have just one moment. Sure.
Tuesday at 10 o'clock then, okay? Thank Tuesday you. Tuesday morning at 10. Thank you. Stepping off. All right. Thank <laughs> you.